The YouTube creator Nate the Lawyer recently posted on social media that he had a brain tumor and underwent surgical resection. My name is Brandon Bieber. I'm a neurologist, and I'm going to do an analysis of his situation and the image of his MRI scan that he posted online. But let me be clear that I'm just making commentary about things posted online. I don't know the details of his personal situation. I'm just speculating about different possibilities. This doesn't necessarily all pertain to his personal situation. But anyway, Nate the lawyer is an attorney and he makes videos about current events and comments on legal issues and explains them to the general public. And he reports retrospectively he may have had symptoms for a little while, he had some headaches, but maybe they were not severe, he did not know anything was seriously wrong, but then he started to get more symptoms, having blackouts, becoming a little bit confused, having vision difficulty, and maybe even not recognizing familiar people. Some people with brain tumors can have focal seizures. Now, when you think of seizures, you're probably thinking of generalized seizures where people lose consciousness and convulse throughout the body. This is caused by spread of electrical activity throughout the entire surface of the brain and causes a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, also known as a grand mal seizure. But people with brain tumors can sometimes have seizures that stay focal around the area of the tumor and could cause more vague symptoms such such as staring spells or confusion. Seizures coming from the temporal lobe are known to cause staring spells, and there could be subtle physical symptoms such as fluttering of the mouth or hand during the seizure, but they can be subtle and missed by family members, and the person themselves may have subtle symptoms such as a sensation of rising warmth or a distinctive deja vu sensation, like I can't describe it, but I know that's the feeling I get when I'm having a seizure. Often, seizures in the setting of a brain tumor are treated with the anti-epileptic drug levetiracetam, brand name Keppra, typically at a dose of 500 to 1,000 milligrams twice a day. And in the setting of a tumor that's causing a lot of local inflammation, this medication may be continued for a while, but the individual may not develop permanent epilepsy. It could be weaned off later on. But even a brief seizure causing a staring spell can be dangerous dangerous. For instance, if someone's driving a car or climbing a high place, they could get into a terrible accident. So even a minor seizure can be life-changing if it can't be controlled. So Nate decided to go to urgent care, and initially it wasn't clear that it was anything serious. Apparently one of the doctors thought it could be something like low potassium, but eventually he had a CAT scan of the brain that showed he had an abnormality on the right side, and a subsequent MRI scan showed that he had a brain tumor and it was originally reported to be the size of a golf ball. And here's a picture of Nate after the surgery. You can see he has this large scar over the right parietal and right frontal area and this external drain. Now, some people with neurosurgical procedures, they could have a tube directly into the cerebrospinal fluid-filled spaces called a ventriculostomy tube. But I think this is more of a superficial tube just to drain the scalp and prevent a hematoma from forming like a Jackson Pratt drain or something similar to that. And you have to say he looks pretty good considering he just had a 12-hour surgery. Now, they reported that the tumor was actually arising from the meninges, the coverings of the brain, not the brain itself. And he explains that the tumor could not be entirely removed because some of it was near a main artery going towards the frontal cortex. So certain arteries in the brain, like the middle meningeal artery, could be safely sacrificed with no no consequences in terms of neurological disability, but if you were, for instance, as the surgeon to sacrifice a branch of the anterior middle cerebral artery, you could cause a large stroke of the frontal lobe and cause symptoms such as weakness of the left side of the body or cognitive and personality changes, and maybe from a surgical perspective, it just wasn't safe to proceed, and so they were satisfied with removing 90% of the tumor, so this was probably a long and and difficult and technically challenging operation, but it was reported to be successful. He also reports the surgery was delayed briefly in order to be given a medication to shrink the lesion. Typically, this would not refer to chemotherapy to shrink the tumor, but rather to a steroid medication to shrink the swelling around the tumor. The most common medication used for this neurosurgical reason 
would be dexamethasone. And this is a steroid which can cause side effects such as elevated blood sugar, elevated blood pressure, and in the long run, other problems such as weight gain and thinning of the bones. And typically people would wean off this medication later on, but it can dramatically reduce symptoms related to the tumor and make the surgery safer. Neurosurgeons also often prefer starting an anti-seizure medication prior to performing the surgery because people can have seizures as a complication of neurosurgical procedures. Here's an image of his MRI scan that he posted online. What you're looking at is a coronal image. And so here you see Nate's brain and his right eye, and this is his neck, and you can see his teeth a little bit. Now, this is a coronal T2 flare image. On this type of MRI scan, the cortex, the surface of the brain where the neurons are, looks brighter, and the underlying white matter looks darker. And this is the opposite of what you would see if you actually Actually cut into a living brain and the computer is suppressing the signal of the cerebrospinal fluid making the sulci look darker here on a normal t2 sequence this would all look bright and what he's showing is the abnormality is bright and this is the white matter which is very t2 bright now he reported that the tumor was actually in the meninges the coverings of the brain outside of the brain this abnormality within the brain is most most likely edema or swelling of the brain. And on a CAT scan, it would look very dark. And so likely after the CAT scan, it was clear that something was very abnormal, but it may be difficult to tell that it was actually a brain tumor on the CAT scan. It would be difficult to see the tumor at all on this image. It would be more useful to see a T1 image with contrast dye through the area of the tumor. Now, I had a patient a long time ago when I was a uh, first year neurology residency. This is when I was still doing internal medicine and I had a neurology rotation. And I saw a patient for headaches and he had a CAT scan and he had a large area on the right side of his brain that had low attenuation that looked dark. And I went over to the radiology resident and I said, what's that? And the radiology resident said to me, that's a left middle cerebral artery stroke. Now, left middle cerebral artery stroke that was very large would be expected to cause severe right-sided weakness and speech problems in a right-handed person. And this guy didn't have any of those symptoms. And so I told the radiologist, no, that's definitely not correct. This guy just has headache. And he assured me he was right. But I did an MRI and he ended up having a tiny meningioma, a small benign brain tumor of the meninges, but a very large amount of edema. So it is possible to have a tiny golf ball sized tumor and a very large amount of swelling. And the good thing about that situation is the swelling can go away and the symptoms can get a lot better. Now, the other thing to note is this is the right side of his brain. For right-handed people like me, I don't know if Nate is right or left-handed, 99.7% of the time, they would be left brain dominant for language. And so you could have a very large abnormality in the right temporal lobe and actually not really get major symptoms. And you could have subtle problems with the prosody or intonation of speech or problems with spatial recognition, but typically right-handed people are dominant in the left hemisphere for both language and spatial orientation. Some people can have co-dominance, and of course there are some technicalities, like if someone writes with the right hand, but they are actually a natural lefty, they were just forced to write with the right hand at a young age. But this may be why Nate didn't have symptoms for so long until there was a lot of swelling causing headaches. Now, if the edema or swelling gets into the parietal lobe, it's possible to have other symptoms such as ignoring one side of the body known as neglect or having difficulty seeing into one area of the visual field. And as it spreads into the frontal lobe, there's the possibility of confusions. And of course, there's the possibility of having seizures and episodes of periodic confusion. So assuming Nate is right-handed and left brain dominant for language, it would be good for the surgeon because they could aggressively resect the tumor. Now, as I mentioned, maybe they weren't able to get it all because it was too close to a blood vessel. That's kind of a separate issue, but there would be a much lower 
lower risk of permanent neurological injury. And there are cases where people have quite severe injuries to the non-dominant temporal lobe and have perfectly normal language and cognitive abilities and spatial orientation. They could have a very good prognosis as long as the underlying lesion is inherently resolvable. And in fact, I've seen people with large tumors and large areas of the non-dominant temporal lobe completely removed and do relatively well. And it's actually possible to do a temporal lobectomy or removing the temporal lobe intentionally surgically, even if there isn't a tumor as a treatment of epilepsy arising from the temporal lobe. And some people can have relatively few sequelae or consequences of that surgery. Conversely, people with severe injuries to the dominant temporal lobe would be expected to have vernikes or receptive dysphagia. In other words, have great difficulty with language comprehension and very fragmented speech, which can be very disabling. Now, injuries to the frontal lobe could be more subtle. Classically, people with injuries to the right frontal lobe, they can have more mania or elevated affect, whereas people with injuries to the left frontal lobe can have more of a depressed, subdued affect, though in the real world, the brain doesn't always read the textbook. As they say, individual symptoms are highly variable, but you certainly can have personality and cognitive changes, which can be subtle with frontal lobe injuries. So what type of tumor could Nate have? Of course, this is speculation. I have no idea what specific type of tumor Nate has. He reported in a video that it arose from the meningitis the coverings of the brain. The most common type of tumor would be a meningioma, but certainly it's possible to have other types of tumors. Metastases could occasionally go to the meninges. Lymphoma can involve the meninges. And occasionally, even a mass that looks like a malignant tumor on MRI scan could be something else like an abscess or tumefactive multiple sclerosis, much, much less likely. But the most common tumor in the meninges would be a meningioma. Now, meningiomas have different grades. Most of them are are grade one or low grade meningiomas, meaning they don't spread throughout the brain or throughout the body, but they can cause a problem if they grow locally and become larger and push on other tissues, or even if they're smaller, if they cause significant edema and swelling by irritating the brain or by causing things such as seizures. So earlier today, I had a patient who had an MRI scan for a completely different reason and it was actually done to evaluate for the possibility of multiple sclerosis. And they happened to have a small meningioma behind the cerebellum that was about nine millimeters, less than one centimeter. And I was able to look back on a prior scan and see that even 13 years ago in 2012, the lesion was there. It was a little bit smaller, so it had grown, but it was still very small, less than one centimeter. And I can tell you from experience, this is definitely a grade one meningioma. And I can tell even from the imaging characteristics, meningiomas often have a dural tail where they seem to be attached to the dura. And the slow growth over time, the asymptomatic nature of it, it's unquestionably a grade one meningioma. And just given the trajectory and the person's age, I reassure assured them that they could have it surgically removed, but it's really not advised. It's highly unlikely to ever become symptomatic and they can live their whole life with it. They could live to 90 or 100 and die of heart disease or some other cancer and it would never cause any problem. Of course, I can't be 100% confident in that prediction, but that's often the case when it's a very small and slow growing meningioma. But they can be surgically removed. And most meningiomas are a neurosurgeon's favorite tumor because they don't have to go into the brain. And usually they're lower risk than other neurosurgical procedures. And often surgery is curative. Now in Nate's case, they weren't able to remove 100% of the tumor, so it may not be curative. But often grade one meningiomas, the surgery is curative. Now what happens in real life is the surgeon may take a small piece of the tumor and during the operation, send it to the pathologist to review the tissue. Now pathologists do very complicated staining, which may take 
days or weeks. They may do immunohistochemistry staining where they're looking for very specific antigens to determine what type of tumor it is. But just briefly looking under the microscope, they can say, yes, this is a malignant tumor. It's not an abscess. It's not a parasite or something else unusual. It's not inflammation like tumor factor multiple sclerosis. And they can sometimes tell the general type of tumor. So meningiomas are characteristic, but they wouldn't necessarily be able to tell the difference between a grade one and grade two meningioma just on frozen section. So a frozen section result, in other words, what the pathologist says during the operation may be something like high grade glioma or meningioma, or it's a benign cyst that kind of thing, and then you would get the full details later on, and sometimes the surgeon would use that information to refine their operation. Let's say it was benign, they wouldn't try to resect it, or it was just inflammation, it was just multiple sclerosis, they wouldn't try to resect the lesion because it's not a malignant tumor. Whereas if it was a high grade mass, they may be a little bit more aggressive in the resection. And then later on, the pathologist is able to look under the microscope, do special stains, and they could look at the mitotic or reproductive activity of the individual cells and give a more specific diagnosis. So most meningiomas are grade one meningiomas, and they usually have a good prognosis diagnosis. And even if a meningioma cannot be completely resected, if it's small, it may grow very slowly after that and not cause too many problems. But of course, many, many years later, if someone is younger, they could need a second surgery. It is also possible to treat a grade one meningioma with radiation, though it is not typically treated with chemotherapy. Now, not all meningiomas are grade one. Some are grade two, and they can be much more aggressive. For example, I have a patient who had a meningioma that was successfully resected from his left frontal area. And it was quite large, which surprised me because I had previously seen this same patient for prior neurological diseases. So this individual had a history of hematopoietic stem cell transplant had vasculitis of the central nervous system requiring aggressive chemotherapy and had multiple strokes and had a grade two meningioma. So this is someone with nine lives and they actually survived all of these potentially fatal diseases and actually had relatively few neurological complications. And I wonder if perhaps their prior treatments, even though they were life-saving, may have somehow contributed to them getting a grade two meningioma. Now anyway, this person had an MRI scan relatively recently, about one year prior, which showed no meningioma, and then a year later, a very large meningioma causing significant symptoms. That will never occur with a grade one meningioma. This one came back grade two, and unfortunately the prognosis can be somewhat worse. There is a greater risk of recurrence and spread to different areas of the brain. It would be very, very rare for any type of meningioma to spread outside of the central nervous system or spread to distant areas of the brain. And I've never seen a grade three meningioma in my entire career. The most common is grade one, less common and more aggressive are grade two. So I do appreciate Nate sharing his story and being vulnerable and sharing some of his medical images. And I do hope he has a rapid recovery from the surgery and reversal of any symptoms he may be having, such as headaches. And hopefully eventually he's able to wean off steroids or anti-epileptic drugs if he's taking them. And hopefully the pathology comes back who grade one meningioma and he's able to have long-term remission and able to get back to doing what he enjoys, being a lawyer and creating content. If you have any questions, please post in the notes below.